Welcome. Speaker Ryan, welcome back to Kill Me and Friends. Hey, how you doing, Brian? I'm doing great. It's yeah, well, first of all, I got to say, my observation from the outside, and hopefully I'll get to talk to you soon uh, on the inside, you seem to be really liking this job more than you thought. <laughs> well, that's for sure. I definitely like it more than I thought. It's kind of because I had to redesign the job and make it more suited to, you know, who I am. Uh, and make it a lot different than the way it had been done lately. So, yeah, I do like it more than I thought I would. I saw you skiing with your family, so right there you were able to carve something out. You had a little bit of free time. So, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, where are you watching the debate tonight? Uh, I'm going to be watching it actually in Florida. I'm doing. I'm in Wisconsin right now, but um, um, I'm doing uh, just a day and a half swing through to help some candidates, some of our our members of Congress down there. So I'm going to do it real fast down there. I'm going to help a guy named Carlos Carbello, who's a great uh, fresh member of Congress from Miami. Uh, and, Mr. Speaker, I noticed right away, you know, when, when things happened, you didn't like the direction of your party. You felt the compunction as uh, one of the leaders, especially formally now, to come out. For example, when Donald Trump made his comments about uh, Muslims, we should hold off for a while, you went out and said, that's not who we are. When you, w- when you look at what's happening on the right now as everyone competes for the one job, and that's getting the nomination, what do you hope is included uh, today in the debate for the viewers to take in? Well, I hope we... Look, these guys are attacking each other to try and beat one another to get the nomination. I hope that we transition as fast as possible into being a unified conservative movement and Republican Party that offers people of this country a very clear, comprehensive, and compelling choice about what it is we need to do to get our country back on track. We are heading in the wrong direction. There are no two ways about it. The vast majority of Americans believe that, as we do. And so our job, as we see it in the House, is not to worry about the primary, but to get ready for the general and get ready for giving this country a really clear choice. And that's why we're developing an agenda to deal with the big issues of the day, a very bold, specific pro-growth plan that we're going to take the country. We're going to roll it out over a series of days and weeks in the spring and so that we can try and nationalize this election on ideas, on what it is to take that's going to take to get this country moving forward and the sooner our candidates can start talking about that, the better we're going to be, in my opinion. But right now, you know, these folks are you know, basically trying to outdo one another so that they can win a nomination. I get that. I understand that. That's not our concern as, as House conservatives. We believe that we need to be working on the ideas and the policies so that when a nominee does arrive, we are a unified Republican Party, a unified conservative movement, right. offering the country a compelling choice. And we're going to go and try and win converts, grow um, our pool, grow our big tent, and, and that's how you win, and that's what we're focused on doing. So I'm with Speaker Ryan right now, and you put together a couple of weeks ago the Poverty Summit, and most of the candidates, uh, Donald Trump did not show up, but most of the candidates did. Here's what Jeb Bush said about poverty, which you want to make it part of the agenda, like your mentor, Jack Kemp, did. Cut 24. Poverty is a lot more complex than what the smart people in Washington describe it as. It's not just economic. It's There are all sorts of limits to people's aspirations, and it's and how you deal with it is, uh, is important. Compassion is not measured by how much money you spend through Washington, through a big administrative bureaucracy, and send it back down to other bureaucrats, filling out forms to eventually get back into a community. Compassion is, in the Greek sense, is acting on your sense of consciousness. Does that capture what you try to get across? Yeah, it does. Actually, I'm on my way over to Racine, Wisconsin right now to... Um, an African American you know, listening session and advisory board to talking to, to pastors and other people who are involved in the front lines of fighting poverty here in southeastern Wisconsin. And what I'm doing is learning from them and seeing what we can do to break down barriers, get government out of the way so that people in their communities can make a bigger difference helping one another. We believe that we need to go at the root cause of poverty, break the cycle of poverty. Instead of the traditional status quo of trying to just treat symptoms of poverty to make yep. it more tolerable, we want to break out of that mold. It hasn't been working. And we believe that upward mobility and, the, and, and opportunity are the cornerstones of the American idea. There are too many people who don't believe it anymore. There are right. too many people who aren't getting it anymore. Today, um, you are just as likely to stay poor if you were born poor as you were 50 years ago when we started the war on poverty. And that is not what should be happening in a free enterprise society like ours. And so we've got to take our principles and apply it to the problem of poverty. 
And as conservatives, I think we can get the moral high ground. We have more to offer, and this right. is something we're going to be talking about all year long. And I know Ben Carson, who came up as poor as poor can be, uh, with a single mom who worked two jobs and uh, didn't even know uh, who his dad was for the longest time. He was there at your summit as well, and his his message could be vital. Uh, when you look in that stage tonight, and I'm sure the moderators will bring it up, uh, their view on blue-collar workers and, and their lack of wage growth as well as poverty, who do you think is best prepared to answer that question, is most conversant in these issues? <laughs> I'm not giving you that answer. I'm sorry. Um, I've got to stay. I'm staying out of this presidential election race, especially since I'm the Speaker of the House. I've got to be neutral on the chair of the convention. So I, I, I just don't um, weigh into which candidate is better on this or that. Um, what matters is that that's what we talk about. And, look, we've had flat wage growth, anemic economic growth. It is a product of the Obama progressive policies. And so what do we do about it as Republicans? We offer alternatives. We say how we would do things differently. Yep. So we can't just oppose and criticize. We've got to propose and show how we do things differently. That's what I want to hear. And I think all of these candidates have something to offer on that. And I hope they focus on doing that. That, to me, is where we need to go as a party. Right. I think we will get there, and the sooner the better. Most people looked at you, especially uh, when you served on Simpson Bowls and everything like that, and they said, who is this young guy who really has knowledge of the budget and does not want the glory, loves the number crunching? And then you become speaker, and you were able to put together a budget, pass a budget right before the break. And a lot of conservative talk show hosts, Mark Levin and, and, and Rush Limbaugh in particular, uh, called you out on that. And they said, we hate this deal cutting. Man, this is just uh, Bain or Light. What was your reaction to some of the criticism you got? Yeah, well, that wasn't a budget. It was it was what we call appropriations, which is about... Oh, that's know, my bad. You're right. But having said yeah, that... Sorry, it was like less than 40% of the budget. Look, I hated it, too, but it's a, it's, it's a system I inherited. The cake was already baked when John Boehner left, and I basically inherited the, the final stages of this product. We made better improvements. We lifted the 40-year ban on, on exporting oil. We put new strings on the IRS. We, we maintained our pro-life policies. So we did advance some conservative causes there, but the point of doing that is to get it behind us because it's a situation everybody knows I inherited so that we can get back to what we call regular order. And that's why this year, after passing an actual budget, our goal is to do our appropriations process the way they, the founders envisioned it. Each bill individually, open rules, let everybody bring amendments, and let Congress work its will. And that, to me, is the way Congress should work. That is how we exercise the power of the purse. So when you have an omnibus appropriations, which we had, which I really don't like, because the process broke down in the, earlier in the summer, you really don't have Congress to, working to the fullest extent right. that it can to exercise the power of the purse. And that's why I'm, I'm focused on getting back to what we call regular order in 2016. Right. Are you disappointed personally that Donald Trump will not be on the stage tonight? Uh, look, I'm just not going to get into all of that. You know, I, I, I'll let people make up their own minds and, and, and draw their own conclusions. Um, you know, my, my point is I just try to make a habit of not commenting on the day-to-day. -day. Right. I'll, I'll take it an exception every now and then, but this one, just I'll just let it be. And finally, this is the hardest-hitting question you cannot duck. Did you get the smell of cigarette smoke out of your office yet? Yes, it took me about three weeks. Uh, I had to repaint the walls, put an ozone machine in, and redo the carpeting because, you know, you just can't get it out of carpeting. It's amazing. Well, uh, Speaker Boehner, uh, Speaker Boehner, Speaker Ryan, thanks so much. Uh, I look forward to